Something that makes me know that he's real. I'm born of his spirit, and I know in my heart he lives. The sacrifice for all men, and his blood cleansed me from sin. I was there, but I know. I wasn't there when they led my dear Savior away To Calvary and they nailed to the cross that day From the manger to the cross, the lonesome old grave Something that makes me know that he's real. I'm born of his spirit, and I know in my heart he lives. The sacrifice for all men, and his blood cleansed me from sin. I was there, but I know. Jesus still lives Though I wasn't there But I know Jesus still lives there, but I know Jesus still lives, don't you? Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord for his word. It gives us that great truth from the Bible. All right, those of you that want to go to children's church, those of you who are seven and under that would like to go to children's church, you're welcome to do that at this time. You don't have to go to children's church. You're welcome to if you want to. Thank you all very much. I appreciate that this morning. 
Well, right before I uh, preached this morning, last Sunday was Pastor Appreciation Day. The church was extremely good uh, to my wife and I, far better than we deserve. And they had actually ordered some gifts for our wife, Brother Kyle's wife, Miss Aldry, my wife, Miss Hallie. And those gifts did not come in. And so Miss Pam called me earlier this week. And I was supposed to have done this prior to now. But uh, we're going to do it right now. Brother JD is going to give these gifts to our wives. Hallie and uh, Miss Aldrich, y'all come up here, please. We thank God for our congregation uh, uh, allowing us to do this and everything they give. And we thank God for these two ladies here for being a helpmate to their, to their husbands. And uh, we thank y'all very much. Thank you for all y'all done. What's it? Do we have to open the Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I hope it's something embarrassing after that. It is. That's a good Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Nice. Appreciate that this morning. The church has always been good to me, and I appreciate that. And I'm also thankful that the church has always included my wife and always been extremely good to my wife as well. We thank the Lord for that. Uh, the church uh, blessed us greatly last Sunday with the many gifts that people gave us and the church given us as well. And for that, we're, we're extremely thankful. Thank you so much for all that you do for us and all that you have done for us over the years. I've never taken it for granted, and uh, I'm, I'm certainly thankful for your sacrifice so that I can do what the Lord has called me to do in placing me here as the pastor. All right, enough about all that. Acts chapter 26. That's, I um, appreciate the goodness of the Lord and the church. And I get very embarrassed about talking about me, and uh, the Lord sure is good to us, and we're thankful for his blessings upon us. Now we're in Acts chapter 6 this morning. Normally this would be our Sunday evening um, sermon, trying to keep pace with our uh, Baratrell Baptist Institute. And so we are, this is lesson 8 of Acts chapter uh, 26 for our third semester in the book of Acts. So we'll go uh, quickly with the help of the Lord today. I would like to make it through the entirety of Acts chapter 26, just going through making some brief comments uh, on the chapter, but we'll see how the Lord leads and where we get to. I will say this just to give you a little bit of background. Some three, four times I believe the, the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit, the Lord used different prophets and other things to warn the Apostle Paul not to go to Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul went to Jerusalem anyway, and in doing so there was a mob of people that tried to take the Apostle Paul and kill him. In Acts chapter 21, he was rescued by the soldiers and the chief captain of that day. In chapter 22, Paul had the opportunity to speak before that mob that tried to take his life. Later in that chapter, Paul was set to be scourged or to be beaten. And he claimed his Roman citizenship and got out of that beating. He was imprisoned. And in chapter 23, Paul speaks before the Sanhedrin. And there was a group of men who came together and made a vow that they were going to kill him. But he was able to escape that thanks to his nephew uh, warning the chief captain of that day. That was a blessing. And then in chapter 24, Paul has a hearing before the then governor Felix. Felix resigns or, or whatever the case may be, the new governor or Festus, the new governor. Yeah, that was Felix. The new governor is Festus in chapter 25. Paul has opportunity to stand before him and to, to, to tell his case. And here we, we finally make it to chapter 26. I do want to say this, up to this time, they've not been able to find anything to charge the Apostle Paul with. They've really not even been able to find anything to accuse him with. They really have no reason to be even be holding him in prison. But nonetheless, he's been there for two years. And in chapter 26, he gets to... Uh, to speak before King Agrippa. And that's where we come to in chapter 26 and verse number 1. 
The Bible says, well, let's pray together and, we'll, and then we'll jump right in there. Father, thank you for this opportunity you've given us today. Thank you for this church, these people. They're such great people, such a blessing to us in our lives down through the years. And we're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity uh, that we have today to stand before them with an open Bible and share some truth from your word. Would you help us today to say something that would be an encouragement and a blessing and a help along the way? And then, Lord, if there were to be one here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, or maybe something would be said that would speak to their heart, encourage them concerning uh, their need and the urgency to receive Christ as their Savior. And, Lord, for all that you do, we'll certainly not fail to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Bible says, Then Agrippa, verse number 1, said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. Verse number 2, he said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Now, something here that Paul makes mention of, I think you and I should uh, see as well, and that is it ought to make us happy, happy to have opportunity to speak for Jesus. Paul was happy about the fact that he had an opportunity to speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ. It ought to make you and I happy. In fact, it ought to be one of the things, those of us who are believers, that makes us the happiest, and that's to have an opportunity to speak for the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 23, or verse number 3, he says, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Now Paul begins his conversation here with King Agrippa, and he begins this conversation by giving him a compliment. I don't think that the Apostle Paul is trying to butter him up or anything like that at all. I simply think that Paul knows something good about the king, and why not use what he knows good about him to try to get his attention or to gain his audience. This is a good way as well for you and I to start a conversation with people in hopes of being a witness to them if we see something about their uh, appearance, something about their attire, something they really like it if they have a little dog and you make a compliment about that. Just any kind of anything to compliment them, to get them to stop and to give you their ear for just a moment that you might have opportunity to say something about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle Paul wants Agrippa to hear him and so he compliments him at the beginning. Notice at the end of verse number three, Paul says, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. It seems that Paul is doing what a lot of us preachers do, and that is he pre-warns his intended audience that he could be a while in speaking. He, it may be that he has a lot to say, and he wants him to hear him patiently. Now, hopefully I didn't lie to you guys this morning and I told you that I would try to be brief today and speed things along due to the activities that we have uh, scheduled for today. But nonetheless, oftentimes, oftentimes we are lengthy in our speech and it seems that the Apostle Paul is warning Agrippa of that. He begins in verse number four. He said, my manner and life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which, when me, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, under which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Verse number eight. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Now, I believe the Apostle Paul is making a great argument with King Agrippa here in his case. He's saying, simply, I'll paraphrase, he said, if there is a God, and if this God can make life, why is it not also highly possible or highly likely that God can also raise the dead? Now, the Apostle Paul here, he is, he is talking to King Agrippa. He 
is asking him, why is this such an amazing thing with God that he has the ability to raise the dead? Now, we know here that Paul is talking to King Agrippa, but there's a group of individuals here, a large part of which happens to be Sadducees, and I've said this so many times, but I'll keep saying it. They're sad, you see, because they do not believe in the resurrection. And so Paul is making this statement to King Agrippa. The Sadducees is there. He wants them to understand that he is in favor of preaching that Jesus Christ has raised from the dead. Paul is condemning them for not understanding this, this simple truth that God is able to raise himself from the dead. Look at verse number nine. He said, I verily thought with myself, now, Paul is speaking of his life prior, prior to his salvation or prior to his conversion. And he said, I th barely thought with myself. That's the problem with every individual who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. That is their problem. He, he had the same problem that many have, and that is that their highest priority is themselves. Notice what the Bible says, and hold your place here, and come to Luke chapter 12 for just a moment. Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12, the Bible says this in verse number 16. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. It says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Now notice verse 17. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. So here, this, this rich farmer, if you will, he is having a conversation with himself. And it's, it's, far, it's, it's very similar to the Pharisee, who I, I believe it's in the, in the book of Mark, maybe. He stood and the Bible says, prayed within himself. Or, and so here we, we see this in the Bible. He, uh, he, he, he said, God, I thank thee. It's like he's looking in a mirror and he's saying, God, let me tell you instead of us listening to what God has to say for us. And so verse 18 he says, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. I'll tell you, we get in trouble when we think of ourselves or think within ourselves or converse with ourselves concerning the things of God. We ought to consult with what thus saith the word of the Lord, amen, and act accordingly. Now come back to Acts chapter 26. We'll look at verse number nine again. Acts 26, verse number nine. The Bible says here, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now remember, Paul is speaking of things that occurred in his life prior to his conversion, prior to his salvation. Now I want to give you something here from this verse that uh, I got from Brother James. It's an outline from, for this verse of Scripture alone that is great. First of all, we see the word I. The wrong person is in view, amen. What did Jesus say or what does the Bible say? Not I. I, I get in trouble when I look to I and, and all through the Bible we see that situation in that case. Now, second of all, the second word, thought. Now, intellectual knowledge can't save you. It takes the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. And so when we have this, this idea or this thought that I can do this or I can do this and I, and I can obtain salvation or obtain favor with God, we find in the Bible that faith teaches us or we learn from the Bible that our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is what saves us. It's not our intellectual knowledge. I thought, third of all, with myself. Well, just as we made mention a moment ago of this rich farmer in Luke chapter 12 and this proud Pharisee in Luke chapter 18, he consulted someone that was no smarter than himself. You see, when we consult ourselves, we're consulting someone who is no smarter than us. When I, when I seek advice, I want advice, advice from someone who I think has more knowledge or more insight than I do. And so, uh, you, you know, when we ask for our own opinion, and we do that quite often, 
we should, we should automatically understand that we could do better. <laughs> when, when I ask for my own opinion, the first thing that I should think of is, wow, well, well, I could do better than that. And so here, here's what usually happens when we answer ourselves, and you've heard this so many times in people's lives, when they, when they are making decisions concerning spiritual matters or things that concern with the Lord, and oftentimes they will say this, I have peace about it. Well, they have peace about something that goes completely contrary to what the Bible says. That's why we don't lean to our own understanding and our own thoughts. We get our advice and our direction from the Bible. And so they either say, I had peace about it, or I just felt the Lord telling me. I promise you that is a dead-end street. And I believe it's a dead-end street with a, with a no U-turn sign at the end of it. And uh, you, you can do better. Seek your advice from the Lord. And so I thought within myself, number four, that I ought to. Now, serving religion out of duty instead of serving God out of love. Now listen, if you're, if you're doing service for the Lord, thank you for that. God bless you for that. We need more people to get involved in the ministry and the labor and the work of the Lord. But I hope you're not serving out of obligation like people do to gain favor with God from religion. I hope that you're serving God because you love him and for what he's done for you. Amen. Listen, if you serve the Lord out of love, you'll continue to serve the Lord. If you get caught up in serving the Lord out of obligation or out of, uh, out of trying to gain some kind of favor with man or even trying to gain uh, a reputation for yourself or a status for yourself, it, it won't be long till you'll grow weary and you'll be finished. But if you serve the Lord because you love him, you'll always have a reason to serve him. See, if you serve God because man wants you to or because you're doing it to gain favor or maybe to, uh, or, or maybe to cause some man to look at you in, in, in a favorable way or to gain praise from man, once that is over, you're done. But the Lord Jesus Christ gave his life for us. He, he shed his blood. He died in our place. I am going to hell without his sacrifice. I ought to serve him because of what he has done for me. Amen. And so we, we don't serve him because we ought to. We serve him because we love him. Number five, I, I thought that I ought to do. Listen, man wants to do, but God wants man to be. God wants man to be born again. God wants man to be saved. God, God wants man to be redeemed. Amen. And so may we be born again if you're not saved. Many things. Number six, many things. Do you know what Jesus said to that rich young ruler? In Mark chapter 10, he said, one thing thou lackest. You know what Jesus said to Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 24? One thing is needful. You know, after the apostle Paul got saved, he wrote in Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 13, he wrote this, this one thing I do. You know, the one thing that you and I need to do, we need to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, before his conversion, was trying to do many things to please God. He was a zealous man. He was a religious man, but he only needed to do one thing, and that is get rid of that religion and put his faith and his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that God has made salvation simple. So he said this, verily I, I thought, verily I thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This thing that he one time did contrary to the name, after he got saved, he became a great preacher and a great proclaimer of the name that is above every name, and that's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at verse number 10. He said, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Verse number 11, he says, And I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. 
Now, it's kind of obvious here that the Apostle Paul was tormenting these believers. I don't know any way that you could get a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to blaspheme unless you were torturing them or torturing those that they love. And so we, we, we certainly understand that that's, this is what is going on here in this verse of Scripture. He said, And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. Paul's not just angry. He, he's gone mad. He's gone insane. You've, you've heard the phrase or the terminology, a mad dog. You say that because that dog has gone in, insane. He's gone crazy. And so we have the idea here that Paul was out of his mind, being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. And so Paul, he, he persecuted before his salvation, these Christians, he ran them out of town. He ran them to other cities. And then he even chased them to those cities oftentimes and persecuted them there. That's Paul's life before Jesus Christ. I, I'm sure that there's people here today that's been saved and there's things in your life prior to your coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior that you're not too thrilled with and some things you don't even want people to know about but aren't you glad the Lord can take all of that and turn it around, amen, when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul has many things to be ashamed of, but you and I have many things to be ashamed of. Paul has many things that, that I, I'm sure that bothered him throughout his life serving the Lord Jesus Christ. There are things that bother me. I have scars from my past that will never go away, but I'm glad the Lord Jesus Christ has made a great change in my heart and in my life and in the direction that my life is headed today. Same is true with the Apostle Paul. Verse number 12, he said, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, now he's getting into his testimony now, he says, at midday, O king, I like this, Paul is getting to the point where he's going to tell about his conversion and he wants to make sure the king is listening. Maybe, maybe the king has, has done like some of you do. You, you begin to nod off a little bit and maybe the king was getting a little bit bored with, with, uh, with, with the conversation or maybe he didn't seem to be all that interested in what the apostle Paul was having to say and so he's getting to the part of his conversion. He said, oh, by the way, listen up, O king. I want you to hear what I'm about to say. And so he says, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, I like several things about this that we won't labor on because we actually did when we talked about Paul's conversion back in Acts chapter 9. But the Bible says here, when we, we were all fallen to the earth. So they all fell to the earth. They all saw the light, but only Paul heard his voice. You know, oftentimes, uh, many times down through the years, I, I, I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor for many years uh, before his health uh, uh, doesn't allow him to do that anymore. And so I spent many, many, many days, many, many, many services throughout the years. And I've, I've been in, in services in times when, when the Spirit of the Lord really began to work in people's hearts and people's lives. And, and uh, even since I've been preaching numerous times, there'd be a, a congregation of people and the Lord would be speaking to hearts and there would be individuals that it was, I'm not saying the Lord wasn't speaking to everybody, I don't know, but it was apparent that God was speaking to some people's hearts heart, but not to everybody's heart. And so here's a group of men with the Apostle Paul. They all saw what Paul saw, but only Paul heard what God said. You know, I, I'm not sure today what, it's amazing sometimes when, when you talk to people and they have heard you preach either in person or, or via one of our ministry outlets that we have, and they, they recite to me what I said when I was preaching. I'm like, really, did I say that? I, I, I don't usually go back and listen to see if I do or not, but I'll tell you what happens. I'm standing here as a man. God has placed me in this position. But with the best of my ability, I'm trying to speak what thus saith the Lord. And many times, God will take his word and speak to your heart. Sometimes, oftentimes, not even something that I may or may, or may not have said from the scripture, God begins to deal with your heart from his word. The apostle Paul said, we were all there. We all saw the light, but I heard the voice of the Lord. I thank God for the day that I heard 
the voice of the Lord. I'm glad it just wasn't one time that I heard his voice. I'm, I'm one of those hard-headed kids, you know, and, and uh, I, I, I'm, for, for all, all my life I was drugged to church before I was uh, ever born, and, and so I've been, to, been to, in the church all of that nine months, as people say, before I was born, and then after that, in a Christian home, always hearing the Bible, always praying together as a family, always reading the Bible together as a family, but I was hard-headed, and on numerous occasions, I'd be sitting in that church house, and God would speak to my heart. I don't know who else in the congregation saw the light, but I know one thing, I heard the voice, and God did that over and over and over in my heart, and gave me an opportunity to receive him as my Savior. Thank God for speaking to the hearts of individuals so that they can be saved. And so Paul said, we all saw the light, or we were all fallen to the earth, and I heard the voice speaking. Now, this may be just a little bit out of or off track, but it's some useful information. He said this, and I want you to notice it very plainly. I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue. Now, when you hear this charismatic crowd talk about tongues, and you can ask them what language are you speaking, because that's what the Bible says, and in, in Acts chapter 2, talking about these languages, or these, these tongues, they're languages, and you ask them, what language are they speaking, and they'll say, well, we're speaking a heavenly language. Well, I got news for you, the Bible tells us what the heavenly language is. It's Hebrew. <laughs> so, if you can't speak Hebrew, I don't know what you're jibber-jabbering about. But, but anyway... How about that? Verse number 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet before I, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. What a great message the Apostle Paul just delivered to King Agrippa. What a great truth and what a tremendous blessing this is to you and I who are saved. I want you to notice the very last word, the very end of this statement. We'll mention several things about the end of verse number 18. But I want to start at the very end of the verse and work our way back. Notice what he says in verse number 18, the very last word, me. We know the Bible teaches us in verse number 15 that Jesus is the one that is doing the speaking. And so the me here at the end of verse number 18, he says, sanctified by faith that is in me. Listen, I want you to understand something very clear this morning, it's very clear that if we're going to be right with God, we're going to have to be in Christ and Christ in us. We sang the song this morning, Abide in Him. I'm glad that I am abiding in Him, but I'm glad that He is abiding in me. Amen. Now, notice also it says, in me. Listen, it can't be some intellectual fact about the Lord. There has to be some sort of contact. There has to be some sort of relationship. I, I've talked to numerous people who have a knowledge. They have a head knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, some people even have somewhat of a Bible knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But just to have a knowledge of Christ is not enough. Have you received him? Have you placed your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? We could ask it this way. Have you been born again? Are you saved? Have you received the new birth? It is about being in Christ, in me. It is a relationship. How does that work? Look what the Bible says. He said, among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in me. It is by faith. We're sanctified by faith. It's not works. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is what sanctifies you. It is this relationship. We don't have time to go through the entire passage, all the verses here, but these things are mentioned in this passage of Scripture. It is, it is faith in Jesus Christ that sanctifies you. This relationship with Jesus Christ gives us the inheritance. Thank God for that. This relationship with 
Lord Jesus Christ uh, is, is, gives us our forgiveness of sins. This relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ transfers ownership from Satan to God. It transfers your position from darkness to light. What a, what a great load of truth the Apostle Paul just dumped in the lap of King Agrippa. I like it, don't you? And he said in verse number 19, he calls his name again. He said, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient under the heavenly vision. So Paul said, I saw this vision. I heard this voice of the Lord. I was not disobedient to what I saw and what I heard. I wonder today how many people have heard from the Lord. I, you have been shown from the Bible what needs to be done in order to be saved. Oftentimes, you have even, you, the Lord has even dealt with your heart concerning your need to be saved. You have, you have so to speak, heard the voice of the Lord speaking to you concerning your need of a Savior and you were disobedient to that light and to that word. Paul told King Agrippa, I didn't just receive the message, I was not disobedient to that message. Listen, a lot of folks hear and a lot of folks see, but they're disobedient to what they see and hear. Listen, if you're not saved, if you're not saved, the Bible refers to you as a child of disobedience. Paul said, I was not disobedient to the voice or to the light or to the heavenly vision. Let me show you this. Hold your place here and come to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, in verse number 2, I'll go ahead and read in verse number 1. It says, and you hath he quickened, that means to be made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Let me, let me say this about that word quickened. I, I thought about I went by that really quickly. And you hath he quickened. I said that word means to be made alive. It does, but it means more than that. It means to be made alive to never die again. Amen. I'm glad that I have been quickened, amen, who were dead in your trespasses and sins, wherein in time past, notice this, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So before your salvation, before you were made alive spiritually in Christ Jesus, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, you were referred to as a child of of disobedience. Now, come to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Just over a couple of pages. You're in Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the next little book, chapter 3. Look what the Bible says in verse number 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. It lists them, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetous, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on, and what does it say? The children of disobedience. And so if you're not saved, you are a child of disobedience. Paul said, I was not disobedient under that heavenly vision. Now, the Bible, let's see, I could, yeah, in Romans chapter 1, well, let me, let me, look, let me just tell you this. In, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, the Bible says, as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. So if you are saved, you're referred to as obedient children. The Bible speaks in, in the book of Romans, obedience to the gospel is mentioned in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 5 and also Romans chapter 16 and verse number 26 talks about obedience to the faith in both of those passages. Now come back to Acts chapter 26. I'll try to finish up here. Acts chapter 26, look at verse number 19. He said, Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now, I, I just want to say this without going into a long sermon on repentance. Repentance repentant is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repenting is turning. What we see here is turning from religion, to returning from dead works and unbelief, and turning to 
God. One of my favorite passages in the book of Acts, I've mentioned many times, uh, Acts 20, verse 21, uh, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so repenting is not just saying I'm sorry. Repentance is turning from Religion, returning from dead works and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we also see something else in this verse as well. Repenting is producing some works that back it up or some works that prove it. Well, that's about what I expected. Nonetheless, it's still in the text. It is very clear, it says they should repent and turn to God and, conjunction, do works meet for repentance. So true repentance, there will be some works that prove it or back it up. It's still true even if you don't believe it. Amen. Look at verse 21. For these, for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Verse 23, that Christ should suffer and that he should, and that he should be the first that should raise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So there were people who were raised from the dead, either by God's power directly or by God's power through someone that he gave the ability to raise them from the dead. Now, we, we have no power, we have no problem at all believing that God raised people from the dead. We, we believe the scripture, we know that that's possible, but Jesus was the first to raise himself from the dead. And there's, that, that is, he got, he got up from the dead by his own power. What a blessing. Now, nobody has done that before. Nobody has done that since. But the Bible says plainly here that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should raise from the dead. What a blessing. Verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Now, Festus has had all he can take. He, he has heard all that he wants to hear from the Apostle Paul. He's not, he is not willing to receive the message that the Apostle Paul is preaching. He is not willing to conform to the message that the Apostle Paul is relaying. He doesn't want to hear it anymore. You and I, you and I that are faithful to witness to people have had conversations with people who heard all they were going to hear and they were done. That, that's Festus in this passage of scripture. He, he's heard everything that he wants to hear and he doesn't want to hear anymore. But I want you to notice a thing, one thing here about the Apostle Paul that's made mention of in this verse that's different from Peter and John. If you remember earlier in the book of Acts, uh, the, the Bible gave us the perception of Peter and John that they were ignorant and unlearned men. But the Bible says here, Festus said here, much learning doth make thee mad. So Festus here, he understands and he recognizes that, that Paul is no dummy. He, this is not an ignorant and unlearned man. This apostle Paul, he has great intelligence. He's an intelligent man and he is speaking to us. This is a smart man. This is a brilliant man. But in spite of his brilliance and his intelligence, he's lost his mind. He's gone mad. And so uh, he, he's a Paul, much learning doth make thee mad. No, no, no. He's not mad. He's not mad. He's peculiar. <laughs> Amen. Jordan may mention that in Sunday school this morning. We're to be a peculiar people. Verse 25, verse 25, Acts 26. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Now, I, I like this. He refers to Festus here, most noble Festus. Paul remains very polite. And he, may, he remains very courteous towards the governor, Festus. Now, this verse gives us a good Bible definition for the word sober. It means to be in your right mind. It means to have full control of your thoughts. And so he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and soberness. Verse 26, for the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. 
Now, Paul is still speaking to Festus, but he is telling Festus that Agrippa knows about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He knows about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, he, he's zeroing in. He's not necessarily, you ever done that before? Paul's in conversation. He's trying to get to Agrippa. Festus is in the way. So he's telling, he, Festus already confessed the fact he's not interested anymore, but he, he still wants to reach Agrippa. So he tells the Festus, what Agrippa needs to hear. And he said, he believes in Jesus Christ. He believes that he rose from the dead. He's sitting right there. And uh, he said, you know, I, I, you, I'm not, you can say I'm mad if you want to, but Agrippa knows I'm telling the truth. You, you may think I'm, I have lost my mind, but he knows. And now look, he turns, verse 27, King Agrippa. Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now, some commentaries and some preachers say that Agrippa here is mocking the Apostle Paul because of his message of the resurrection. But I don't believe that is the case at all. And I don't believe that for several reasons. First of all, I don't believe that because Agrippa plainly said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And there's not a question mark there. There's a period. He made a statement. He said, you have almost won me over to this religion or this salvation of yours. You, I have, you have almost persuaded me to believe the same gospel that you believe. You've almost persuaded me to be a Christian. He's making a statement of fact. Second of all, the Holy Spirit has directed the Apostle Paul to say what I believe is very important here. He said, I know that thou believest. He said, I know you believe. I know you believe this. And I, I don't think Paul is just saying stuff to fill up place in the Bible. I believe the Holy Spirit has, uh, we, we do still believe that the Holy Spirit is the author of all scripture, right? And he's directed the apostle Paul to say, I know that this man believes. I know that this man believes what I have told him. And he's, he's almost been persuaded to be a Christian. And you, you know, you, you know what I, where I'm coming from. You know what I'm saying. I, and look, this is the way to eternal life. This is the door. Jesus Christ is it. And he said, I, 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 I believe that. I, I believe that that's true. I believe Jesus is the only way. Verse 29, notice what Paul said. And Paul said, you know the sad thing about that? Almost persuaded. How many people even today that you know and that I know, they're almost persuaded. There, it's quite likely that there's some folks even sitting under the sound of my voice today, and you're almost persuaded. But what a sad thing, Agrippa is this, he, King Agrippa is this close, he is this close to being born again. He, he is this close to putting his faith and his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and being eternally saved. He is almost persuaded, but, but not quite. Paul said, verse 29, I would to God that thou, that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Now again, why would Paul, why would he say or respond in that way if Agrippa was just mocking him and making fun? He said, I am almost persuaded. Paul said here, I wish you were not just almost persuaded, but altogether persuaded. It's almost like Paul saying, come on, come on, King. Have you ever pled, pled with someone before? Have you ever been pleading with someone? Before? Why, why, what is keeping you from putting your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? What could it possibly be that is keeping you from believing and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Now, he said, he made this statement here, Paul did, accept these bonds. Agrippa was challenged, and I believe that he was stricken in his conscience to be saved. However, Festus, he was just sneering, and he was very contemptuous towards Paul, and he had no interest in Paul's message at all. We, have, we don't have really no word about Bernice here, but it's quite possibly that she had just hardened her heart towards God and the will of God and his word. Paul here is standing before this group of highly prominent individuals and he is in chains. But in spite of the fact that Paul is standing before them as a prisoner in chains, he's the only free man among them. He, he's free because he has the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Paul is the prisoner, but Paul is far better off than the king is. 
Bernice here, uh, some say that she is Agrippa's sister, some say that she's his wife. I, I don't know, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. I've heard the argument from both sides. But whatever the case is, she is related to the king. And by being related to the king, there is no doubt that she is benefiting in her, in her physical life by being related to the king. And so here she is, she's enjoying all the benefits that come along with the relationship of being associated with the king, but the apostle Paul, a prisoner, is far better off than she is. We have the governor there, Festus. He, he has a position of leadership. He has a position of power, but he's miserable. And here Paul is, he's in chains, he's in prison, he's been there for more than two years, but he began the conversation way back in verse number one, I think myself happy. You know what the difference is? The difference is Jesus Christ Amen. in your life. These men, these, these individuals, they had all that the world could offer physically, but they don't have Jesus. Paul's standing there in his chains, in his bonds. And I couldn't imagine, I've never been in chains, I don't ever want to be. But I can imagine that those steel bracelets on his ankles and on his wrist and those chains bearing weight upon him and probably even at the waist as well, it couldn't be comfortable. I would think that after moving around for two years, there was probably, there was probably raw spots wore in the hide and in the skin, probably even sores that had begun to heal over, no doubt even got infected but the Apostle Paul was the happy one. The Apostle Paul was the one with peace. The Apostle Paul was one with a future and with a bright hope. And Jesus Christ is what made all the difference. Listen, friend, you, you may have all the affluence in the world. You may have, have all the notoriety. You may have all the positions and all the power. But if you don't have Jesus, you are of all men most miserable. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know what else Jesus said? Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. These people are dead and they're trespassing and sins because of their disobedience. But Paul was not disobedient to the message and God had given him eternal life. And not only did he have eternal life, but in spite of his earthly condition, he had life more abundantly. He was happy. Ain't that a blessing? Now look, let me read the last verse and I'm done. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. It seems to me that if Paul had not appealed to Caesar, King Agrippa might have set him free. Now, if you think about that, you can come up with all kinds of ideas and situations and circumstances and all that. And, I, and I'm not going to get into all that. I'll just say this. Paul has been made a promise by the Lord Jesus Christ that he would make it to Rome and he would stand before Caesar. So that's where he's going. Amen. I'm going to get Brother Kyle to come this morning, if he will. Miss Keisha to come. We'll stand together. We'll sing a hymn together. And if the Lord has spoke to your heart today, maybe you would like to come. I, I don't know anything of, about many of you. I have no idea what you're facing in your life. You may not be in the situation that Paul is in by physical chains and physical bonds, but there may very well be some kind of problem in your life that has you bound. I want you to understand something today, that through the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be happy in spite of your earthly condition. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not saved, today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. Let's stand together. What are we going to sing? 350. Page 350, if the Lord spoke to your heart today and you'd like to come, we'd like for you to come. We'd like to pray with you.
persuaded doom comes at last almost cannot avail almost is but to fail sad sad the Sad, sad hymn. Imagine standing before God at the great white throne judgment and remember the time that you were almost persuaded. As the songwriter said, almost is but to fail. Sad thing. Thank you so much for coming today.